Hola niños y niñas and welcome to another edition of the Bleed Los Podcast. This week's podcast is presented by our partners at Bet Online. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports, contests, and events with first to market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports info from line in, live in game betting, props, and futures. If you head on over to Bet Online today and, uh, and make your first sports bet, if you use our promo code BLEAV50, B L E A V 50, you will receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. Uh, joining us this week in, in the Carnasada uh, is the, uh, the, the actor, comedian, producer, creator. Also, I mean, this this dude's resume is, is increasing, and it and it's a funny ass show too. Uh, who lose this fool, uh, Chris Estrada? Chris, how you doing? Good, Alonso. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. Yeah, thank you for having us. I uh, uh, the thing that uh, that stood out to me when I looked up, you know, because uh, I always like to look online, you know, for the descriptions of the show. Uh, Julio Lopez, a punk ass bitch with the heart of gold, who goes out of his way to help everyone but himself. That might be my most favorite descriptor of any oh, TV show. That's I my heard. least favorite descriptor. <laughs> <laughs> it's that's on IMDb. That's how they have it. I know. It. I've been meaning to change it. <laughs> uh, this the show's loosely based on your life, so so I know there's a lot of that uh, that Seinfeld, you know, kind of uh, comparison, yeah. which you know, it, it's it, in some cases not fair, but but I, I'm mm. I've been curious when you hear someone say their show is loosely based on their life. How loosely based on your life is this show? Um, you know, a lot of it loosely based in like not everything is 100% my life. Uh, it was things inspired by other elements. But like loosely, it's sort of like, you know, I grew up with a single mom. I live with my grandma. I have two sisters. I, I had older cousins that were gang members. Uh, it takes place in South Central. I grew up in Inglewood and South Central. So taking those elements, uh, injecting a little bit of my personality into the character and you know kind of thinking of my character of like where would i be if i'm not if i wasn't doing stand-up comedy and kind of thinking like this is probably where i would be at like in life you know so thinking about it that way and kind of late, uh, letting letting my personality and sort of like some of my history dictate what the show is and whatnot no it's it's a it's a great show and then you know with okay. with your your uh you know your your cast, if you will, that that joins your Frankie Quinones is on the show, mm -hmm. hilarious guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you've so if you've seen the uh, the Cholo Fit Creeper stuff, that's Frankie Quinones. Mm -hmm. uh, he's yeah, he's, you that's know, right. Just, uh, but also the thing I like about you, not even just from this show, right? But you talk about it in your stand up. Uh, mm -hmm. As someone that is also forklift certified, I uh, yeah. I like how how you uh, you you kind of you know talk about that that stuff and the realness of it too, right? You still had a yeah. real job. Up yeah, until this yeah. show got picked up and you're, you know, yeah. you're still, you were still doing the thing. So, so I wanted to ask you when the surrealness of it, I know you've talked about, but yeah. has it really hit you yet that this is kind of, Oh, this is, this is what I'm doing now. It, it trips me up because like, I, like I said, I was working, I was a stand up comedian. I've been a stand up comedian for the last eight to nine years here in LA and then doing shows on the road and whatnot. But it wasn't until the last, like maybe, in the last few months, in the last month since the show's been out, uh, people have like, people will recognize me and that's kind of a trip. Like, cause I forget, I still, I, I still have the confidence of a forklift driver where I'm just like, emotionally, I'm still there, you know, <laughs> or emotionally I still work at a warehouse, but I forget that people they know the show and watch it. So sometimes I, I walk around like I have a regular fucking job, you know, <laughs> like I, I walk around like I have a regular job, forgetting that, you know, and I think a lot of it is because when we were, I, we were writing the show and then we acted in the show, I acted in the show and then I wasn't done. We edited the show. I was part of the editing process. So it's been like, it's been work the whole time. So I really do forget. It's weird when people recognize me and I go, oh, yeah, I guess uh, I am on a TV show. <laughs> like, I, I forget about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, not non-forklift <laughs> yeah. certified uh, Alicia yeah. Del Valle here. 
uh, uh, who has not also had a regular, just regular fucking job like you were talking a minute ago. Uh, <laughs> she, because people stop her all the time. You, you would be surprised. Yeah. Like we'll be out and about, and people yeah. just randomly stop her. And she, and she even says to herself, "I haven't been on news in forever," and they, she still gets stopped all the fucking time. LA legend. <laughs> yeah. I well, actually, that is a great way to bring up what I wanted to discuss. Mm-hmm. Alonzo is correct. I, I have a very loyal, very small following from my days doing morning news, many years doing morning news. And before that was morning radio. I feel like there is um, a thirst, a hunger for more representation. And I don't want to turn this into a TED talk, but there really isn't, there aren't enough Latino sitcoms out there compared mm-hmm. to all of us out here, right? Our buying power, our voting power. You got your own show, Chris. You know how badass that is? I mean, like, <laughs> that that is, so when I saw the advertisements for this full, I'm like, whoa, 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 what is this? Because there are others who have tried yeah. and taken a script and taken someone's story, because this is mm-hmm. your story, Chris Estrada, and ruined it, right? It could have been something great, but no, yours is authentic. And I don't throw that word around loosely. Oh, it's authentic, it's ha- like hella funny. And you mm-hmm. cover topics that might be taboo to others outside of LA and you yeah. still make it universally appealing. So kudos to you first, happy oh, Hispanic you. heritage, Latinx, Chicano mm-hmm. month. And mm-hmm. how did you get your own show um, and Fred Armisen to produce it? Tell me that process from doing stand up on the road, having a day job, and now you have your own show. Man, that started a long time ago. That started in 2018. I was uh, I was doing stand up here in Los Angeles, and um, you know, I was I, I knew these comedians named uh, Jake Weissman, Matt Ingebretson, and Pat Bishop. They had their own show on uh, on Comedy Central, and that show was called Corporate, and it was a really dark, like office comedy show. And those fools hit me up one day. I was working at my warehouse job, and they were. Like, I got a text from Jake and he was like, hey, we produce stuff now and we show run, we show run our own show. Would you be interested in working in something with us? And, you know, I was doing stand up at night, but like I said, stand up doesn't pay until it pays. So I was still, I still had a regular job like Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday. So I said, yeah, yeah, let's meet up. And then I met up with them. And then um, I, they were like, what ideas do you have or what do you want to talk about? And they were they were sort of the guiding light in this. They said, they said, why don't you why don't you write about from where you come from, like you're part of LA, and I was like, all right, cool. And you know, think about some of your family. And w- we really like film a lot, so we were we're all like film buffs. So we love movies by the Coen Brothers and stuff like that. So we were like, let's make it look really cinematic. And then I said, all right, cool. And then I kind of told them, I said, I don't want to touch on anything too woke. Like, I don't want to, I'm not trying to change anybody's mind with this TV show. I just want to present life as it is, you know, mm-hmm. and like, and show characters that are flawed or honest. Like, I'm not trying to, I don't want to write a morality play. And right, right. Yeah. I don't want to write a morality play. And then they were like, great, we're all in tune with that. So then I went off and I ca- came up with this idea and then I came back with them and they said, this is good. Let's keep working on this. And we kept we co-created and we kept working on it together and you know we were really inspired by shows like atlanta we were really big fans of atlanta and aside from and just like other comedies uh uh especially movies and then it was kind of dead in the water because nobody really knew me i i was getting kind of some accolades like i was showcasing for comedy central i was doing something for hbo i did something for a few other like my name was kind of rising in the industry and getting buzz, but you know, nobody really knows you when you're like, when you have industry heat, you're just kind of known in the industry. And then um, a few months had passed and then they hit me up and they said, do you mind if we share this with Fred Armisen? One of our managers knows his manager. And I was like, yeah, but you know, I thought that fool was not gonna hit us up back. Like I thought, oh, it's gonna be like a month before we hear back from him. And then they hit us up and they were like, Oh, a week later, he was like, he likes it. He wants to talk to you guys. So it was pretty cool. I had to like take, I was still working at my warehouse job. I took my lunch break all fucking dirty with, a, with you know, like I'm all sweaty. And I had a faja on 
you know, like <laughs> yeah, I had a brace on, and then I was like, I went to go, I went to go talk, uh, I went to go talk to him in the car, and like I was in my lunch break, you know, and then wow. I went back to work right after, and but he was really nice. He just thought like I'd love to help you guys, and how can I help? And they go, would you be willing to attach your name and help us pitch it? And he goes, yeah, absolutely. So that was really cool. That's how he came on board. I love it. I love that it's also Fred Armisen because as someone who's a devout Saturday Night Live, you know, viewer, yeah. as was a little girl, um, that he always played the Latino characters on that yeah. show, right? Like yeah. he was always like dancing salsa. Or, yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. I, he's I not feel like, well right? <laughs> he he yeah. appreciates us is what I was getting to. Yeah. I love that he, he attached his name because that made the process go faster, right? Because George Lopez, mm -hmm. when he got his sitcom, um, yeah. he wasn't going to get any leverage or any looks and, until Sandra Bullock attached her name to it. And yeah. so this, I'm trying to look at the formula so that more of us are out there telling our stories because yeah. this is so funny. And you brought yeah. up how they asked you to write about characters. I love the women mm. in your show. Oh, like thank you. Yeah. You know, like we are mm. so, we come in so many different sizes, shapes, colors. Yeah. I mean, we're a Dodgers podcast, right? But we focus yeah. on LA culture, on tacos. Yeah. A lot of people outside of LA don't understand that we are, um, we're not a monolith, right? Like we are many. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I don't look like my like mom. I don't look like her mom. And so your characters, including Maggie, Maggie's mm -hmm. a good one, like the yeah. little bit of toxic relationship. Were you mm -hmm. involved in the casting? And was it important yep. to you that uh, your mom and your grand, your abuelita didn't speak uh, English? Yeah, yeah, that was important to me. Like I was involved in the casting. So when I pitched, when I was creating the show with the, with the showrunners uh, who I told them, I said, uh, well, I don't want the mom and the grandma to speak English. And they asked why. And I said, well, mom, I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, I was born here, but my parents are not from here. And if, if my mom didn't speak English, my, my grandma didn't definitely, definitely didn't speak English. And then they were like, they were really open minded. They said, perfect. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll do it that way. They, they actually, they actually thought that was interesting. You know, they thought that's great. That's really cool. And then, I said, yeah, I'll just talk to them in Spanish and like they'll talk in Spanish the whole time. And, you know, I know some par some people who are like a few generations here, their parents speak English and that's great. That's I, that's cool. But my mine didn't. So I just wanted to be authentic to that. Also, it was just one of those things, too, like when it comes to the word representation, it's a I don't. I don't really know what that means. I, I know what it means. I know what people are trying to say it means, but it's a such a big word that it almost doesn't have a, a specific meaning because, you know, when people say Latino representation, well, you know, my life as a, like growing up and where I grew up and my parents not speaking English and my mom was a janitor and my dad was a bus boy and we grew up broke. That's very, that's a very different life from a kind of rich Cuban in Miami you know or like oh, yeah. or or a rich venezuelan in miami or that's a very different life from a third generation puerto rican in the bronx you know like right. so I, so when i just when they i in terms of representation i just thought i won't i'm not going to be worried about representing latinos i'll just be worried about representing my life you know and well, i think because when you when you try to think about it in uh big scope you're you're gonna lose because you're gonna try to please a lot of people you're gonna mm -hmm. go oh i'm gonna try to please a lot of people by doing this and i just thought i'm not really concerned with that i mean i just i just want to represent what my life is and what the life of people who i grew up around is and that's it and i i'm pretty sure and we kind of looked at it more like through the lens of class like we were like okay let's look at it like these are working class people and because i grew up working class you know so, right. and I think if you, whether it's in Spanish or not, people know what it's like to not be able to fix your roof and go put a tarp on the roof. Or yeah. if you have, if you have a parent who grew up working at a, in facilities like cleaning, like being a janitor, then you know what it's like for your mom to bring home toilet paper because she <laughs> takes it from work because she wants to save money and stuff like that. So 
you know, I think that's a thing that from a class perspective, it resonates with people. That's like the episode cans, right? Like yeah. you're not poor, yeah. you're broke. Like there's a difference. Yeah. And see, and, and yeah. when I say representation, I just mean tell our stories. Yeah, there are yeah, so yeah. many out there. That's all I mean. Like it's, it no, I know what be, you mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm just so excited because I could relate to, I didn't grow up in South Central, but I grew up on the East side. Um, yeah. And I love that you have women that look a bunch of, like your sisters too, right? We just yeah. look like we're normal. We have kids. We're trying to make, yeah. you know, ends meet. We're trying to, but you do it in a way that's funny. And even your, your, when you say you bring in characters that you grew up with, I love the, the race that you touch upon. And again, you're not being preachy. You're not trying to be, uh, you know, pushing morality. It's just yeah. the way you grew up. And that's the way a yeah. lot of us grew up, but we never saw it on TV before. So yeah, like Devante, yeah. right? With Tassos. Mm -hmm. Like I love yeah. that episode. You've got the Dodger jerseys, you've got the Laker jerseys, and of course yeah. the Raider jerseys. I'm gonna hand it over yeah. to Juan because he's our Raider friend. <laughs> um, I just love the way that it just yeah. it's just authentic. And and I would just oh, want to thank, thank you. you and, and and please let me know that there's gonna be another season because I don't like the way yeah. it ended last season. You had me worried. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we wanted to end it in a way where we would make ourselves worry. You know, because yeah, right. we, would, uh, we wanted to scare ourselves and go like, if we if we end it this way, it'll challenge us to be more creative next season. And you know, because if not, it we are trying to we want to make sure it doesn't become like a traditional sitcom where you're visiting where nothing ever changes. And you know, since since it's more similar to modern comedies like Atlanta and Rami and stuff like that, those kind of comedies. We want to make sure that the world feels real life where like sometimes yeah. sometimes things close down sometimes people break up sometimes um people die like things like that you know so yeah uh, yeah. But, yeah texting and driving it's an epidemic yeah. i mean i'm not fangirl i could go on and on about your shows like <laughs> It really means a lot, Pharrell. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Yeah. Juan, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I could I could poke his oh, brain yeah. on. Hey, hey, that, that's the point. <laughs> hey, it's a carne asada. We're just kicking it yeah. right now. I just <laughs> and Chris, you know, uh, Alicia mentioned the authenticity. And to mm -hmm. me, there is no more authenticity when you're telling a story about Los Angeles than yeah. when I see people wearing Dodger gear. Whether yeah. you are a fan of the team or not. You yeah. see people repping the Dodgers. Now, this is a Dodger-centric podcast. So I, I have a couple questions for you. First of all, yeah, yeah. are are you a baseball fan? And yeah. is it the Dodgers? And how, how much of a fan are you? No, I'm, you know, I, I've been a little busy in the last few years with work, so I'm not keeping <laughs> them up as much. But the, the Dodgers really played a huge role in my life. Like as a kid, I remember... We used to go, my tío Nacho used to take me to Dodger games and my tío Carlos like would take me to, and I grew up listening to the Dodgers through Jaime Jarin. That's who I, that's <laughs> how I grew up listening to the Dodgers. Like my tío, he used to have, he would watch the Dodgers in English, but listen to Jaime Jarin on the radio, like watching it. So I have this strong visual of my tío listening, watching it in, muted on English, but listening to Jaime like sports casting. So to me, that's like a big deal. That's always been a part of my life. Even from, I mean, even from a kid, like growing up in Inglewood and South Central, we would catch the bus or my tío would drive us out to like Echo Park and we used to go eat. God, I, I'm forgetting the name of the restaurant. Do you guys remember that Mexican restaurant on Sunset that closed down years ago, but we used to go eat there before we would go see a game? How it far was, was it from the stadium? You know, quite it, right on... It, Kind of more close to the corner of Park and Sunset, but it was it, it was it was on the same as some of the bars are. But anyways, mm -hmm. I it, it just it played such a big role. I grew up in the late '80s, so you know, just seeing Fernando Valenzuela, like you know, all that stuff became huge to me. And like you know, yeah, I'm a big Dodgers fan, and I, I'm in love with the history of it. You know, it, 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 you brought up a couple of triggers on the show here, all right? Yeah. I mean, we we are a, a show that stands for Jaime Jarrin, and we stand for Valenzuela. And yeah. and you mentioned it right now because, mm -hmm. I, you know, I grew up in the 80s. Everyone on the show thinks I'm trapped in 1985. It's a very <laughs> uh, traumatic year for me. But I, I, I can't say this enough, especially maybe for people who aren't from here. 
I don't think they truly understand how a franchise, and in particular the Dodgers, because I think the Dodgers, in maybe not by design, but they embrace the Latino more so than the Lakers. I think yeah. it eventually became that with the Lakers. Mm -hmm. But the Dodgers, to me, I think were the team in L.A. I don't know. Maybe the Raiders are the other exception. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned Harin. Like, this yeah. is Harin's last season. He's yep. he's retiring. And we want to give that guy his flowers now, right? Oh, because to it. me, yeah. you just met, you gave a, it's a beautiful story, what you just mentioned right now. And that yeah. is how many people, the way the same way they did the English speaking public did it yeah. with Vin Scully. How many mm -hmm. people did that with Harin? Oh, and the, all of so many. All my tios did it with Harin. Like, that's how I grew up, like, hearing his voice. Like, I don't know. It's just like, I'm telling you, it kind of, it kind of gives me chills because my tío Carlos, who is not around anymore, but like sometimes I'll put on, I'll listen to Jaime Harin because it reminds me of my tío. You know, that's, it's almost, a, it's a comforting thing to me to think about it like that, you know? Or I just remember my tío taking the, even when we would go to games, he would mm -hmm. have his radio. He always had a little mini radio that he would hear Jaime call the game live when we were there. So to me, I don't know, I just... I just love that. And I think that has to do a lot with like, you know, as Latinos, like to see Fernando Valenzuela, but also to see other like to recognize like Puerto Ricans that play in the game, you know, like, you know, to Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Cubanos, like, and like just all other people. You, yeah, baseball felt, I guess, inviting in that way, you know, I think to a lot of Latinos and yeah. So especially it's your in LA. Are, so are you of Mexican descent or? Yep. No, I'm okay. Mexican descent, yeah. So uh, let me ask you this. When you would, when your tío would take you out there, yeah. uh, we, are, we had a recent guest, Julian Torres. We baptized mm -hmm. the pavilion now, El Palenque. So yeah. that, that's, that's how it's known to us. Where did mm -hmm. you sit when your tío took you to, to the Dodger games? Were you out there in the pavilion or were you up at the top? Oh, come on, dog. We were up at the top. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we were up we were up there in the top with binoculars <laughs> hey man the top deck is is a great is a great scene man you have a lot of fun out there but the other mm -hmm. one is, is valenzuela right yeah. you, you mentioned valenzuela and on the show we're on this crusade to get his number retired right yeah they don't give out his number right nobody yeah. wears it but they won't retire it because he's not in the hall of fame We've talked about this with many people. When you go into that stadium, to me, the majority of that stadium are Latinos. I mean, yeah, it's it, it's all it's all Mexicans, right, in yeah. there and stuff yeah. like that. Do you think it's disrespectful that the Dodgers haven't retired that number, but they'll give out bobbleheads for him and they'll yeah. make money off of him? But, I mean, to me, retiring that number means something. Like, listening to yeah. you talk about your uncle and Harin, that's yeah. what baseball's about to me. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. So much of baseball is kind of memories, you know? Yeah. It's like, and you know what it is too? Also, like, even just looking at it from like a class perspective, like baseball games have always been cheaper than basketball games. Yeah. Always. And, you know, if you're just like, my tío was a jardinero, so it's like that's something he can afford, you know, is to enjoy a baseball game. So, I don't know. I, I do think it. Yeah, I wish they would retire it. I mean, I could see that being perceived as disrespectful. I don't know that they're intentionally being disrespectful, but I could I could see it could definitely be perceived that way. I think they should retire because, you know, I also read that like I don't know so much about this to be true, but I also read that like once Venezuela came in the game, it changed everything like yeah. it, it brought in, you know, it brought in an even stronger like, you know, uh, Mexican-Americans who might have felt a little way about, like, Chavez Ravine at a certain time mm -hmm. or, you know, people who knew about that maybe had feelings about it. When Valenzuela came in, it, maybe it made them feel be a part of it a little more, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, I, 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 I mean, I, I mm -hmm. could talk to you more about the Dodgers, but I do want to bring it back to the show because mm -hmm. – I, I think it's really funny that originally, I guess, the show was called Punk Ass Bitch, and then you yeah. changed it to This Fool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you? I, I I read your reasoning as to why you made yeah. that change. Did anybody give you grief for making no. that change? 
No, not at all. I mean, because the grief was that, like, the the reason was that to call the show that is kind of it sounds like gimmicky to me, but it also presents like a like a binary. It makes you think that in the hood you're either a gangster or a wimp, and you're not. That's not true. You know, that's a that's very a black and white way to look at the world. You know, I, most people are just regular ass dudes living lives in the hood. You know, like having a working class job, and they're not they're not gangsters and they're not wimps. They're just so I wanted to make sure that I didn't present that like, oh, either you're a gangster or a wimp. Like, cause, you know, that's, you're just a regular dude if you're not that, you know? And I well, wanted I, to make sure to emphasize on that. And to me, I would, to me, that's why the comedy works so well in the sense that yeah. you are a regular guy. I, I mean, when I saw the show, uh, He's mm -hmm. a listener of the show, so he might get this reference. Shout outs to you, uh, Shinebox. We refer to him as a cholo nerd, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> he he dresses like a cholo, but he, mm -hmm. he is a nerd. He likes uh, yeah. comic books and all that stuff. Yeah. So I, I feel a lot of the humor, especially the male representation and how yeah. you deal with the duality in, the, mm -hmm. in those characters is hilarious. I have to tell oh, you, one of my you. favorite jokes when someone referred to you as having a pompadour and you snap back at him and you say, it's a gentleman's cut. <laughs> I was laughing so hard at my girls looking at me. What's so funny? And I was just like, it, I have never heard gentleman's cut in a show before. And that to me, okay. it just, it, it lend itself to the authenticity. Oh, so yeah. congratulations. So much, sir. I really mean a lot. Thank you. More seat, right? Like <laughs> what? That yeah. And then the episode with the little boy thinks he's going to be in a yeah. gang and it's West Side oh, yeah. Story. Yeah. It, it reminded me of that episode. And I don't know if you're a fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, yeah, but there's yeah, yeah. an episode it. where he goes into New York and he's dating a girl and her and the son is, he thinks is it, like they're turning the son yeah. gay. Yeah. That yeah. to me, I don't know if that was an homage, but... Oh, yeah. But yeah, we're big, we're big Larry David fans. And, you know, a lot of that was like, you know, just being inspired by like good comedy like that, you know? Yeah. And before I send it over to Alonzo, because you brought up Larry David, uh, I, I heard that story about Seinfeld when Seinfeld came and yeah. saw one of your, your performances. Mm -hmm. I have to say, man, I, I'm curious to see what your reaction is. But to me... It seemed kind of like a dick thing for Seinfeld to do. But what is like when you when if there's somebody up like somebody that you've admired your whole life and for them to just dismiss you or yeah. even like put you down, how do you overcome something like that? You know, I didn't take it personal because when he saw me, it was I was doing this show at the, at the Hollywood Improv in their side room. It was called The Lab. And it was a challenge show. It was this show, like a gimmicky show where you're not doing your traditional set, like mm -hmm. a comedy. It was like you pull a challenge from the bucket. And then he, he, my challenge was to get play the piano as I do my jokes. But I don't know how to play the piano. So I just started <laughs> like hitting keys and saying the most dirtiest jokes ever. And then, <laughs> you know, he walked in when I sat down. So he didn't know it was a challenge show. He had no context for me. So then when he saw me make an idiot out of myself and then I got off stage and he got on stage and I, w I didn't even know he was in the room he didn't know it was the challenge room so when he said what was that that guy was awful I it it, it made me laugh so much because it made me think of that uh, Seinfeld episode where uh where George gets in a pool and his woman his girlfriend comes in and she oh. sees that he <laughs> That it's not as big as she thought, and he yells. <laughs> he goes, "I was in the pool. I was in the pool." It, it it literally it makes me think like I was like Jerry. It was a challenge show. It was a challenge show. <laughs> that's what it makes me think about. You know. Well, well that's good. I mean, yeah. that that's a very positive way of looking yeah. at it. I just when I read that story, I thought it was kind of like heartbreaking and i just kind of oh, looked at seinfeld differently where i was like oh. what a dick dude you didn't yeah. have to say that even if you thought okay it was awful yeah. yeah i mean you don't have to say that oh you guys know the you guys know the curb your enthusiasm connection to the dodgers right yeah oh yeah that documentary yeah. i it's documentary saw... man yeah. hey, shout, shout out to juan catalan he catalano he's amazing i met that guy a few years ago at a comedy show and i was like starstruck to meet him because you know being at a Dodgers game, 
saved his life. Yeah. 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 Yeah, For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, there is a documentary on Netflix about a guy who he was like accused of murder. Was it murder? It was Murder. murder, right? Yeah. Yeah. But he was in an episode. They were filming an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm taking place at Dodger Stadium. And they used the footage from that episode to prove his innocence. And yeah. uh, that, uh, that that's it's really amazing that. Yeah. Speaking it's of it, you also time. worked. Yeah. You you also work with uh, Danny de la Paz, right? On La Ramfla. Yeah, yeah, that's so funny you mentioned that. That was like a music video from years ago. Like, I have a buddy, he, he hit, this is years ago, like, I gotta imagine, like, almost seven years ago, he hit me up and he was like, hey, do you want to be in this music video? And I said, yeah, sure. And that's when Danny de la Paz was in it. I, I <laughs> met Danny very briefly at a film festival, and he... Mm -hmm. He, uh, yeah, he's an American me. You'll, you'll right. recognize him if you if you see him. He was very generous to me. I I, I had a film in the film festival, and he oh. walked up to me and he was like, "You did that?" And I was like, "Yeah, man." And just like you, where you're just kind of like, "Hey, it's no big deal," you know. I'm just doing it. Yeah. But the fact that he you know took the time to to acknowledge yeah. what you. I'm sure that's probably what you experienced, right? Walking around LA, people showing how proud they are that you, you've achieved success, man. They're rooting for you, yeah. right? Yeah, people are really nice, man. It's overwhelming, I can't, in a good way. It's, it's like overwhelming where people, what I like is people feel connected to it in a lot of ways. Like people like the LA element of the show. Like when people in LA, I, like I was just performing uh, stand up in Tempe, Arizona this past weekend. And there was people who used to live in L.A. who came up to me and were like, I love that show. But also just people, people who aren't from L.A. or aren't from like similar backgrounds like that we all share, you know, all of us four. There's people there was like it was really amazing to see there would there was like, you know, there was indigenous people in Arizona who were coming up to me like natives who were like, hey, we're we came to watch you. We love on the res nearby. We got to tell you we love this show. And that, like, you know, for them to, you know, reservation life is a lot different than living in a city like Los Angeles. So to hear that, that's like, oh, that's amazing. But also it means a lot when people are just like, oh, you did L.A. right. Or if people, you know, if people are just like, yo, my mom used to be a janitor and I love how you depicted that. And you didn't make it look, you didn't pity her. You didn't make it, you didn't make her a hero. You didn't make her, you didn't pity her. You just showed it like normal life. You know, and I love when people like that, you know, or when they like the humor. I mean, I'm a comedian. So when they think the show is when they tell me that the show is really funny to them, like that, I mean, that's great because the, the mission was to make the show funny. Yeah. Thanks to you, Chris. I refer to everyone. Yeah. I, thanks to you. I refer to everyone as Playboy now. I go around. Oh, yeah. What's up, Playboy? What's up, Playboy? <laughs> Yeah, joining us, uh, joining us here for uh, for a couple more moments is uh, the yeah. only person I've ever heard refer to themselves as undefeated at being defeated. Uh, Chris oh, yeah. Estrada. Uh, that that's one of my favorite bits that because oh, I like how you me. tied the the open relationship thing in into all yeah. that. Well done. That's a, that's a good bit. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I, uh, I I wanted to ask you uh, the, the two things before we set you loose. Yeah, One, because you, you do a, a really good job, like you mentioned, of tying in all the L.A. stuff. What's your relationship with arguably the best page on Instagram, Foo's Gone Wild? Oh, man. <laughs> other than I other than I think that page is hilarious. And I think um, the guy who runs it, Little Mr. E, is an amazing curator. Uh, I met him. He was a really nice guy. I did a show for Foo's Gone Wild at the comedy store that this really great comedian. If you guys get a chance, check out this really great comedian. He's from Long Beach. Uh, his name is Jesus Trejo. You won't I regret it. I love Jesus, Jesse. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Jesus is actually a writer on this sh uh, on the show. He's a writer. Oh, on the show. Wow. yeah. Bravo. Did not know yeah. that. Yeah, Jesus right. is great. And uh, Jesus Jesus hosted a Fool's Gone Wild show that I was a part of. But other than that, I don't really have a like a connection. Other than I'm a big fan. And I'm and I'm inspired by them, and I also I'm also grateful to them because look at that page. That that's a page that has 2.2 million followers, yeah. and it and it's um, 
that guy is doing, he's curating and he's being irreverent and he's being funny. But at, along the way, that guy, he doesn't hold back. He's doing positive things. He'll raise money for, for certain things and he'll help out people. And he, he's also not afraid to call out things that he finds bad. Like, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll say racist, r- racists are lames. And, yeah. you know, that's... Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if, uh, if you're not following them, definitely go follow them. Uh, my my yeah. favorite are the uh, what city is this uh, is this law uh, what is this for- representing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Or when you see a couple, he he puts a couple. He he puts a picture of couple, and he goes, "Where did they meet?" <laughs> 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 and you'll see people. My my favorite is when somebody will put like panorama swap meet. <laughs> I also like when he does the uh, the Fouville news, like when they're doing like yeah. the police chases, and he chimes oh, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. And of like course, I you know the, the just the classics that don't do scante. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and last thing, uh, you know, yeah. his show. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you, obviously, we talk about all things Los Angeles, right? Todo, todo, mm-hmm. todo el barrio. Uh, yeah, but we're, we're about we're about Dodgers baseball. We're about LA, but we're also about tacos. So I gotta yeah. ask you, where do you go get your? What is your favorite taco, and where do you go get that in LA? You know, for a long time, my favorite taco spot was the original Teddy Teddy's taco, Red Tacos over uh. in, in South Central. The truck, yes, that, that started it all. There was a truck on Slauson. Was it Slauson and Avalon? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Slauson and Avalon. And I remember one of my boys hit me up uh, like a few years ago, and this was before John Legend knew about them, before they blew up, before they had like Super Bowl commercials. <laughs> this was like a good five, seven years ago. And he told me, he goes, "You gotta go with, the, gotta go to this truck to me with me." And I have, I have a cousin who lives in Tijuana, so I, I, I already. Like I was already eating birria tacos, but you were only getting really birria tacos in Tijuana. Like mm-hmm. you, you know, that wasn't that hadn't taken off that much here yet. So I went to try it, and you know, the line was long. That will give you the little botito de consumel. <laughs> and yeah. dude, I loved it. And then I, to me, I love seeing that because they became such a success story. They have like, dude, they got a Super Bowl commercial, and then they got like brick and mortars. They got one in Venice Beach. They got another location in Pico Rivera. Like, I don't know. I just, I, I really love what they represent. Their, yeah. their food rips. Their food absolutely rips. rips. <laughs> yeah. I'm a rips. champion of Teddy's. Ask these guys. Every yeah. time yeah. I bring it up, I bring up Teddy's. To me, there is no Vampiro Taco better oh, than the one on. that Teddy's. Yeah. I mean, I try them elsewhere, man. They don't compare to Teddy's Vampiro, man. That I is like a hell of a taco. Yeah, next level. Next level. Chris, next level. thank you yeah. so much, man, for the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 oh, yeah. Hit me. The, I was asked when I told some of my friends you were coming on our podcast, they got yeah. really excited. And I have too. So the Cali Mex market where you take the hugs, <sighs> uh, not thugs, cupcakes. Is cupcakes, that in high yeah. yeah, you know what's so funny? We wanted if because the show takes place in South or, or the neighborhood stuff takes place in South right. Central. And we couldn't we couldn't get uh, we couldn't get uh, a supermarket in South Central at the time to let us film. So then we filmed it. And, and what's so funny is the director of the episode, I kept saying, people are going to know it's not South Central. And then he's just like, every, he goes, no, it's TV. Trust me, no one will notice. And then I go, dog, oh, there's no man. hills. There's no hills in South Central. I go, I go, you know who will notice? I go, I go, for, you're going to get me in trouble with L.A. Latinos. L.A. Latinos are going to know. I go, I go, L.A. Latinos. Because, you know, I did a show at the Laugh Factory and some Latinos from from uh, from from uh, South Central came up to me and they were like, where's that Calimex? That's not, where is that? <laughs> they were like, we're from South Central. We don't know where there's a hill in South Central. And then I had to... <laughs> I had to break their heart and say, dog, I'm going to break your heart right now. All respect to Highland Park, but it's in Highland Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but, but fools in Highland Park are super proud. They're like, that's yeah, the Cali yeah. So, you know, yeah. it's balance. It's balance. No, it's, it's a balance. <laughs> but you know what? I, 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 I love that we use that store anyways, because when do you get to see a store like that on a TV show? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And really quickly, last one is the cholo with the nunchucks. 
So oh, I have no. my theory. Can you please explain what it is? Because I'm I'm probably wrong, but <laughs> okay. why so, is there a cholo with the nunchucks in random shows and random scenes? So let me tell you about him. He's the best. Um, his, <laughs> I'm actually looking him up right now. I know him through Instagram. So there, he calls himself Kung Fu, and his name is, <laughs> his name is Christian Bayerto. Uh, Bayer, Christian is his name. I forget his last name, but he's a very talented guy. He's just a skater homie from Highland Park, actually. And if anybody wants to follow him, he puts these amazing nunchuck videos of himself. He trained himself to how to do amazing work with nunchucks. His name is Kush, S T Offerson, Kush Street Offerson, um, and he he's. We, you know what it is? We wanted the show to feel surreal. Like sometimes we wanted to put weird things in there just to for the world to feel surreal and different. And then I just kept. I, I found him on Instagram. I also saw him on Fools Gone Wild. I saw him on uh, his pages. He has 30,000 followers, so people would share his things. And I reached out to him on Instagram. I was like, hey, dog, you don't know me. I'm a comedian, but would you like to be in a TV show? And he was like, hell yeah, let's do it. And <laughs> we just put him in there. And he's he's amazing, man. That fool, he gets down. I can't. Christian is a G. If people can follow him on Instagram, please do. I'm going to. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Chris. Okay, uh, I'll yeah. let you go. <laughs> I, I do like I do like that his name is Kung Fu. Well done. Kung well, Fu. Well yeah. Done. yeah. Uh, uh, Chris, where uh, where can people find you on the uh, on the Instagram and the Twitter to uh, to yeah. find out what you got going on? Uh, on Instagram, I'm at Chris Estrada Comic, and then uh, on Twitter, I'm at Chris Estrada eighty five, and that's where I you can see me where I post about doing stand up shows in L A. or where I'm where I'm might be performing outside of the city. But also, yeah, just posting jokes and stuff like that there. That's where they can find me. Uh, go follow him like I'm about to, at least on Instagram, because I'm really bad at Twitter. But, uh, yeah. oh, but, good. Uh, <laughs> but follow, uh, go follow Chris and go check out This Fool. It, it's a really mm. funny show. Like it, it's Thank you. Even yeah. if you're not Latino, you'll still understand the shit that they're talking about yeah. because it, it's it's just all, all, all emblazoning. So, honestly, a, a great Great show. Keep up the, the good work, and uh, and then hopefully we can see you for a second season. Man, thank you guys. Juan, Alonzo, Alicia, th thank you for – it really means a lot to be a part of this. And our RIP Vin Scully, and, you know, shout out to Jaime Harin and everything he did for, you know, for, for us, you know. Hey, you're, yeah. you're a friend of the carne asada, but now I think we're going to just refer to you as the playboy of the carne asada. <laughs> Hey, the Playboy. Hey, we're, like we're, we're, we're rooting for you, Playboy. We we okay. hope you get a second season. Thanks again for coming on the show. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. And guys. shout out to the Highland Park homies. Hey, they got a, a shout out to the homies. All right. Looking <laughs> out. Have a good one, guys.